Well, it's been a long day, and what a beautiful, wonderful day it has been, certainly in our fiction uh, stage here. So, Ron Charles, book critic for the Washington Post, Al Sections here, and he will start taking over with introductions for Miss Meg. Okay, welcome. Thank you. First, a word of thanks to our co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and other generous sponsors who've made this event possible. If you'd like to add your financial support, there's a note in the program. Please seek that out. We'll have some time after this conversation for your questions, and I've been asked to remind you that if you come to one of these microphones, you will be included in the videotape of this event in the library's permanent collection. So keep that in mind if you don't want to be recorded. My guest today is Meg Wolitzer. The author of The Ten Year Ma Nap and The Uncoupling and The Interesting and more, but I want to talk, and we will talk about the female persuasion, but first, I want to talk about the wife. Oh, yes. Yes. The wife. <clears throat> My cousins. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this came out 15 years ago, and now we're all talking about it again. That must be incredibly exciting. Yes, I brought a, uh, a sort of show and tell. So this is the movie tie-in edition which is very exciting. And I went and looked it up on Amazon. It's number one in movie tie-in editions. <laughs> so, <laughs> very proud. Um, starring Glenn Close? Starring Glenn Close and Jonathan Price. And I have to say, I mean, uh, I'm prejudiced, but they're incredible. I yeah, mean, they're I mean, people are talking about biased. Oscars. Yes. Yeah, no, this yeah. is very, very exciting. It's very exciting. exciting. It's How did great. the project come about? Uh, well, so I wrote this novel, uh, came out in 2003, and the wonderful screenwriter Jane Anderson got involved at some point not too long after that, and she had a lot of trouble getting it made. Uh, it was hard getting uh, a male star who wanted to play this real jerky guy, um, and it was the movie was called The Wife. <laughs> not only that, so that was sort of difficult, but suddenly things got moved and Glenn Close got attached to it, and. She's brilliant. I have to say, she's really brilliant in it. She's wonderful in it. Please go see. Oh, somebody, oh, excellent. And it got a great review in the Washington Post, which made yes. me very, very happy. Uh, <laughs> but it's been really, having a movie made is sort of the icing on the cake. It's like, I came up with those characters' names. Why are famous movie stars saying them out loud? <laughs> Did really you get involved in the script? Um, no, I, you know, somebody, I had a, a, a book turned into a movie. It was the first film that Nora Ephron directed, This Is My Life. Uh, a long time ago, and I was interviewed for it, and somebody said to me, aren't you afraid what they're gonna do to your book? And I said, my book's on the shelf. They're gonna do what they do, but my book doesn't change. Uh, so I, I tried to sort of leave the writer to do what she does. But what's it like, I mean, you're sitting in a dark room and you're seeing these characters you created up there come to life. What does it feel like? Well, it's really fun. I mean, it's, and when your name gets up there, it's kind of like you kind of look down shyly, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's tremendous because writing is so solitary. I mean, I'm basically mostly, like writers are so excited when we get to go somewhere. Like coming to the National Book Festival is sort of like a dog being taken for a ride in the car. <laughs> I mean, I am, usually, I am usually at home in a big t-shirt that says Ultimate Frisbee or something on it that I don't play and I don't know where it came from. Um, <laughs> When you get to go somewhere, it's just really, really thrilling. So having a movie made is just, it's, it's dreamy and it's not solitary. That's the thing, when you go to the set of a film or a television show that's made of you, like they have to be nice to you, they take you to the table craft services where the food is and feed you. But the idea of being with people, that there is a group of people involved with making something is so different, is the opposite of what I really do because I'm just by myself, talking to myself in my apartment. Have there been some exciting Hollywood moments? Uh, in other people's lives? <laughs> 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 yes, there are a lot. Well, the new book, The Female Persuasion, um, uh, Nicole Kidman is attached Ooh. to star in, so that was really Ooh. fun. But this is all like, when you're writing a book, you don't think about any of this. For me, people say, do you picture who's gonna play these parts? And of course, no, it's a book, it's not a movie. I kind of think that my characters are sort of like, you know, if you watch a reality TV show, which I've heard some people do, um, <laughs> if you watch a reality TV show, the people who don't wanna be photographed in the background have their faces blurry. That's how I picture my characters. I don't quite see their faces, but I know who they are very deeply. Hmm. 
Let's talk about the female persuasion. Sure. Yeah, now it's uh, about a bright young college student named Greer who has a chance encounter with a feminist icon, a woman named Faith, a kind of Gloria Steinem figure who changes her life. And your timing feels uncanny. When did you start this? Was it long before the Me Too movement or? Around the time I got that crystal ball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started it years ago. I mean, somebody asked me in an interview, did you write it after the Me Too movement? It was like, I would have had to have gotten a lot of people together in a room, and I would have said, you take this chapter, you take that chapter. <laughs> uh, yeah, because the ideas in this book are, I mean, ideas around female power and mentorship and misogyny and uh, making meaning in the world are, are things that I've just been thinking about forever, and I think probably most of us have been thinking about forever. They're all new problems, though. Well, yeah. <laughs> we're in a weird moment. When the book came out, it was sort of like a game of musical chairs. You know, it, it happened to come out in this moment. Yes. Um, but it was a time that people were talking in a new way or in a heightened way about so many of these issues. So I certainly had something to say. Did the book change as you were writing it, as you responded in your own life to what was happening in the world? The only thing that I went back and changed really was the last chapter because, I mean, have some of you read The Female Persuasion? Oh, thank you. I'm gonna have to ask the rest of you to leave. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is for those people who've read it, um, just for us. The, so the book is about a famous feminist, as Ron said, and a younger woman. It's about the person you might meet who changes your life, who sees something in you, a mentor, this famous feminist who sees a very shy college student and, and helps her. Um, I imagined when I was writing this book that, we, that it would, when it came out, we would have the first woman president as president. And as some of you may have heard, that didn't happen. Spoiler alert. Spoil I know, I hate that. Don't you hate when people do that? <sighs> I often find, here's a big parenthesis, um, I often find that when I'm talking to a group of people and some have read a book and some haven't, you have to thread this needle so that you don't bore the room nor do you ruin things for yes. the rest of them. It's very, very difficult to do. But I finished the book and I felt not quite right about how I'd ended it and I asked my editor if I had a little time to go back into the last chapter. And I wrote a, a last chapter that kind of goes forward, it goes into the future, to a moment when maybe it's not that sometimes things are a little better for women and sometimes they're a little worse. Sometimes maybe the tablecloth gets ripped out from under everything, like in that magic trick. And I wanted to kind of speak to the future a little bit. So I did go back and add a last chapter. Hmm. You, you, you said one of the major themes is female mentorship. Were there uh, women like that in your own life? Was there a mentor in your life that made a big difference? Yeah, there were a couple. I'll mention um, two. Uh, one is my mother. My mother is a novelist, Hilma Wallitzer, and she's 88, and she's just amazing. She started uh, publishing in the 60s, and uh, for her first short story, which to give you a sense of her mindset at the time, and she was a housewife in the suburbs. Her, her story was called, Today a Woman Went Mad in the Supermarket. <laughs> and I'm telling you, she would have gone mad if she hadn't started writing. Uh, something happened to me uh, when I gave a reading some years ago that I put in my novel, The Interestings, in a kind of slightly different form. I was at a, a reading and I gave a Q&A afterward and a woman stood up and said, my daughter really wants to be a playwright, but I know how incredibly hard it is for anyone, a woman or anyone, to make it. What should I tell her? And I said, well, is she talented? And she said, yes. And I said, and is she burning to do this? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I think you should tell her that's wonderful because the world will whittle your daughter down, but a mother never should. And my mother never did, and I think that's partly why I'm here. So she's the one person, because I think of that as sort of feminism in action. Uh, but the second person is Nora Ephron, who I mentioned earlier. She's somebody who uh, we became friends after she directed the film based on my book, and she was somebody who you always wanted to show your book to. Well, I always wanted to show my book to. She was someone whose opinion I valued, who was opinionated, and very, very funny, and she actually, I think one thing that she gave me is, well, I talk in the book about those people who give you permission. Do you know, do you have people like that in your life uh, that you meet when you're young and maybe they give you permission to be a certain self? I kind of was afraid of being funny, that it wasn't serious, and Nora was funny and serious. And there was a little line that I put in this book and I thought about how 
maybe I wouldn't have written it if not for Nora's encouragement or enjoyment of certain jokes that I did. Um, there's a moment where Greer, when she's in school as a child, she's sort of stuck with the weird girl in the class, and they're sitting under the whiteboard eating Pringles, and the weird girl says to her, do you ever think about murdering our teacher? <laughs> no, actually, no, I got it wrong. Do you ever think about poisoning our teacher? And Greer says, no. And the girl goes, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that that's humor that's not there just for the sake of itself, but it's there to show something about a character and the way the other character interacts with her. And it's worth putting in, even though it stops things for a moment. You get something of the writer's sensibility, and you get more of the character's world. Could you read a bit for us? Sure, it'll cost you, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just read the opening. Um, Greer Kadetsky met Faith Frank in October of 2006 at Ryland College, where Faith had come to deliver the Edmund and Wilhelmina Ryland Memorial Lecture. And though that night the chapel was full of students, some of them boiling over with loudmouth commentary, it seemed astonishing but true that out of everyone there, Greer was the one to interest Faith. Greer, a freshman then at this undistinguished school in southern Connecticut, was selectively and furiously shy. She could give answers easily, but rarely opinions, which makes no sense because I am stuffed with opinions. I am a pinata of opinions, she'd said to Corey during one of their nightly Skype sessions since college had separated them. She'd always been a tireless student and a constant reader, but she found it impossible to speak in the wild and free ways that other people did. For most of her life, it hadn't mattered, but now it did. So what was it about her that Faith Frank recognized and liked? Maybe Greer thought it was the possibility of boldness, lightly suggested in the streak of electric blue that zagged across one side of her otherwise ordinary furniture brown hair. But plenty of college girls had hair partially dipped the colors of frozen and spun treats found at county fairs. Maybe it was just that Faith, at 63, a person of influence and a certain level of fame, who had been traveling the country for decades speaking ardently about women's lives, felt sorry for 18-year-old Greer, who was hot-faced and inarticulate that night. Or maybe Faith was automatically generous and attentive around young people who were uncomfortable in the world. Greer didn't really know why Faith took an interest, but what she knew for sure eventually was that meeting Faith Frank was the thrilling beginning of everything. It would be a very long time before the unspeakable end. So that's just the beginning. Oh, thank you. Tell us about this title and its uh, Jane Austen echo. Oh my God, you're right. No, I did know. I did, I did think of that. Um, wasn't there a Monty Python with a guy whose name was somebody smokes too much? And somebody <laughs> said, oh, people must say things to you all the time. And he was like, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> yes, I love, I like declarative titles. I love that there is a little Austenian thing in there. But also it sounds to me like the title of a feminist nonfiction book from the old days, doesn't it? Because it's a little bit sort of, of the feminine mystique. Yes. Uh, it, it's just got those qualities. And the word persuasion, there's a pun in the title too, because it's really about those people who persuade us, who teach us, and who we want to be like in some way. So that's all part of it. I was so fascinated by the way the novel explores tensions, not between men and women, but between women within the feminist movement, yeah. between different uh, generations of that movement. Yeah, it was my, la my, my last novel, The Interestings, uh, was about everybody who was exactly my age, because I'm really bad in math, so it made it so easy to sort of say, that year she was, you know, I knew what I was doing that year. It was easy. Um, but this time around, it was really about two generations talking to each other, and I got to think about my own becoming a feminist. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I was in a consciousness raising group that we started and we wrote away to the National Organization for Women asking for a list of topics and they sent us things like orgasm and you when we wanted when your mom won't listen. I mean, we were so young, <laughs> but it meant a lot 
to be talking to other, you know, girls, young women, about how we felt about things. And it, it, um, it, it just had a tremendous effect on me. How would you characterize those different generations and their attitudes about feminism when they all identified as feminists? Well, you know, one of the things that feminism has had to do and is in the process of continuing to wrestle with is to be more inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that's something that social justice movements do have to do. And they have to change, they have to be willing to change. And of course, there's a lot of tension between the generations, and we've seen that. It, that's a real thing. But one of the things that I thought about when I was writing this novel, because when you're writing a novel and not a track, right. um, it's the characters that we remember. I, I mean, somebody said what we remember of the books we love isn't plot but character, and I think that's really true for me. But one thing that occurred to me is that these women. Of, a different, of different generations who call themselves feminists, they grew up in a different world. Yes. So their experiences are, are different. But there was this one experience at the very beginning of the book, um, Greer in her college experience at the very beginning, she goes to a frat party and she's groped by a frat brother at the party. And she has this moment that I wanted to kind of try to describe where something happens to her and she doesn't know, wait a minute, does this count? Am I allowed to be as upset as I am? Is it an assault? Is it real? And so many women I had spoken to just over time had an experience in their life, or, or certainly several, in which something happened and their face went hot and they thought, wait a minute, is this just what it's gonna be like being female? Like it could even be something very, very small. And I wanted to track that because the feeling of being a woman in the world, there are some overlaps regardless of generation. And another tension in the book is between idealism and capitalism. Faith's organization is funded by a man of somewhat questionable morals, very wealthy man, uh, and she's willing to make compromises that Greer is not, ultimately. Yeah, Greer sees herself. She's at the beginning of her career, and she imagines things in a certain perfection. But when money gets involved, things always get messed up, right? Yeah. Money and doing good. To me, as a novelist, that's kind of catnip the idea of putting them both together because you know it's going to be complicated. Right, and uh, faith's not, uh, faith is willing to accept the money and do good things with it. Greer thinks the money has to come clean. Yeah, I mean, those are questions that are interesting. Like, faith thinks, well, at least I'm reaching some people. I know it's not pure. I don't take sides. That's the thing about being a novelist is I really don't take sides. I you just, didn't think one of them was right, one of them was wrong, one of them was being questionable. That way. Don't think that I mean, way. I don't. I don't want to do that. I. I feel like a novel is a place where you don't have to do that. Every other place in our lives right now, right? We go home, and we're on the internet, or at least I am, and you have strong feelings and everything. It's like in this moment of the 24-hour news cycle, everything's a hot take. I prefer, if I can, to sometimes be a master of the warm take, you know, <laughs> or even the lukewarm take. The idea of just saying, what is it like for these people? What is it like? And not particularly coming down on the sides. Let's talk about Corey. Such a fascinating character. Sure. Uh, without giving anything away, of course. because And not boring those who haven't exactly. read it. Exactly. Okay. But he's a young man. He's set on a classic course of male success, and his life changes. And he is, is he kind of a male feminist hero? Is that too much to say? Well, one of the things that I got, I, I was hesitated to use the word learned. There was. Seinfeld, I think they were, there was a mandate that they had for the show, no hugging, no learning. Um, I feel that way a little bit about my novels. Um, but one of the things that I did kind of learn, I guess, is that you follow your characters where, where your ideas, the imperative of the book, will take them. And I started to see that in this book that deals with a famous feminist, this cool, she wears sexy boots and she's well known and uh, she has certain, a catchphrase almost, she, and then someone who works for her foundation. What about the people who just quietly go and do good every day? As one of the, the best friend in the book in a, in a argument, big fight scene, says, I think there are two kinds of feminists, the famous ones and everyone else. And that's sort of what it's like, I think, for people who, you don't have to say, I'm political or I am a feminist, but you can do feminist or good work in your lives. And I think one of the other themes of the book is about doing, making meaning for yourself. And Corey has a tragedy in his family and ends up not, not having this big consulting job, but staying home and taking care of his mother. And 
she cleans houses, and he starts cleaning her houses, and it's seen as women's work. Yes. So yeah, I, I really, I, I liked getting to know that story a lot. Corey, yeah, yeah, I did too. I was, of course, surprised, as everyone is who reads the novel about what happens to him, and, and really moved by the way he reacts. A few years ago, you wrote an essay uh, called The Second Shelf. You wrote in there, uh, women's fiction is relegated to that close-quartered lower shelf for books emphasizing relationships and the interior lives of women. Has that affected your own work? You seem very successful. You, it, it's hard to believe that such prejudice affected the marketing of your own books. No, I, don't, I wouldn't say the marketing of my own books, but certainly uh, we've seen that. Um, one of the things I talked about in the piece was the way books by men and women ha you know, have looked over time. And you might have what I sort of a little snidely called a uh, little girl in a field of wheat uh, on a cover, a, you know, in a yeah. book that was by a woman, and you would have the sort of big, bold-faced um, type in a, in a book by a man that sort of said this book is an event. In addition to Little Girl in a Field of Wheat, there's another kind of book, though, that I sort of, Women in Water, the dreamy, inessential yes. book. I guess the thing about those books is you can understand publishers wanting to find audiences, but books that seem to exclude the possibility of, of welcoming readers, that's not what I would want for my book. The idea of, two, I picture two men standing on a train platform. What's that, what's that you're reading, Bill? Little Girl in a Field of Wheat. Oh, yeah, I loved it. I uh, read the, <laughs> did you read the sequel, Little Girl in a Field of Rye? You know, you can't see it. You, the idea of fiction as being inclusive, because we all, look, there was that study that said that fiction teaches empathy. We all knew that. We just didn't have the data for yes. it in advance. But I think one of the things that made me start writing that piece, and I talk about this in that piece, was I was at a party and I met a man and he heard I was a writer. Um, well, first he said, he asked me the worst question. You don't ever ask this of a writer. He asked the worst question. He said, would I have heard of you? Um, is a terrible question. There is one really good answer, though. <laughs> In a more just world. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he said, he said, would I have heard of you? And he asked me to describe my books. And I, you know, what, what themes did I write about? And I, you know, men, women, sexual power, marriage. And his eyes sort of started rolling up in his head. And he was like, you should talk to my wife. And he just got out of there as fast as he could. <laughs> so that started me thinking. About what men and women want to read. Yeah, and, and why? And, and are we programmed for that? And how can we change that? Yeah. There isn't that much difference between the great novels women write and the great novels men write. But they are marketed in. Sometimes they are. I, I hope things are changing. It's hard to know. We're, you know, um, we're seeing some signs of change. Right. Uh, you know, um, Jasmine Ward has won the National Book Award twice, right? Uh, right? Uh, so, but you know what? You write the books you want to write. I mean, I want to write the books that I want to write and hope that readers respond as they will. Because, you know, reading fiction, look, being in a convention center, if I have to be in a windowless place all day, you are the people I want to be with. <laughs> <laughs> because we love fiction. And that's not, it, it's more really about that. Like we live in such a nonfiction world. Right. You know, our lives are anxious and we're online, you know, stalking old boyfriends, or I've heard tell. Um, <laughs> but actually I will say this, the, the internet has had certainly a bad effect on, so, on writing and reading in so many ways. Um, you could be writing a, like a super lyrical passage and you need to take a break from it. You go online and you see, best resorts, and you start looking at a list of the best resorts, and now you go back to your lyrical passage and it suddenly takes place in Aruba. You know, <laughs> I feel that the distractions are so profound yeah. that we need to force ourselves away from them. But being among readers is so hopeful, it, 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 because reading matters. I mean, when you think about, you, you can't quantify the ways in which reading fiction is so important, but all I need to do is imagine a culture where there were no novels, and it, it just, it's just, I, I get so much from reading fiction. I, I feel so moved by reading about other people. You've, the book's been out about four months. Have you had interesting experiences with women uh, coming up and telling you their own experiences with their lives, their 
response to the Me Too movement? Is it, is, it, that is, is it calling out that kind of response among your readers? Well, one thing that's happened is I have signed more, a lot, like a copy for someone and her daughter. Nice. Yeah, Very so that's nice. been really, really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think when you meet a, a reader and you hear a story about how something affected them, it's, it's wonderful. People, one thing actually, uh, in October, before the book came out, long ago, almost a year ago, my publisher had a little media event, and everyone was given a little name tag, and they had to write someone who had been an influence to them oh, when they were young. No. Um, there were a lot of Michelle Obamas and some dance teachers, but everybody, it was a great icebreaker, because if you had someone who saw something in you when you were younger, you haven't forgotten it. Right, yeah. Our discussion's been so serious about the book, but the book is really funny. You are really funny, as, as they can tell. How do you, when you're writing, you're alone, as you said, how can you tell if what you're writing is, in fact, funny? I can't. I, you, you know how you, you know what it's like, the horrible thing about writing a novel is it's in terms of humor. Well, there are many horrible things about writing a novel. <laughs> I, where Let's where to the begin? Humor part. Where to begin? But when I give like the first reading from a book and yeah. people laugh at yes. something, like I'm like, is it a surprise? Wait, that was meant to be lyrical and moving. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Or or surprise when they laugh at another line. It's sort of as if you made a very grand recipe and tested it out in front of the Queen of England for the first time. I mean, you don't know if it's funny or not until you read it aloud. Because I don't sit there trying to. Nobody cracks themselves up. I mean, comedians don't, right? right? They sit there, you know, grimly. Right. Uh, no, uh, I never know. Interesting. But I know, but again, it's about sensibility. I guess the thing is, with writing humor, it's not insert joke here, it's not mad libs, it's just, it has to, it often comes out of character or sensibility. Right. Now you're working on a new novel called uh, To Night Owl from Dogfish? Which it's coming out, it's done. It's done. It's, it's a kid's book. For us yeah. it's coming out, yeah, in uh, yeah. February? Yes. Right. Uh, tell, can you tell us anything sure. about it? Sure, I, I, I wear at least two hats, and I do write books for kids, and this is for middle grade readers. It's so funny, when I refer to my adult fiction, I, it sounds like porn. <laughs> it's my adult, my adult novels, the ones with the plain covers. Um, but this book is uh, co-written with Holly Goldberg Sloan, who wrote Counting by Sevens, if some of you, yeah, okay, great, and, and she's just, it's um, a novel told in emails and letters uh, from two girls whose fathers are single gay dads and fall in love and want the girls to be friends. And there's a summer camp plot, because as with the interestings, I can't stay away from summer camp. It was a, a very important experience in my life. I went to, summer, to an arts summer camp, and I was so pretentious at this camp. Every play that I was in, I used what can only be described as my Katherine Hepburn voice. It could be a Neil Simon comedy, or The House of Bernarda Alba by Lorca, and I was like, Mother, where are you? <laughs> where are you, Mother? You know, I just could not break out of that. And I was so, I would carry that summer. <laughs> I wanted so much to be sort of intellectual. I would carry a book under my arm so people could see it, and it, just like parts of it, it would say, The Magic Mountain, like you could not quite see the whole title of The Magic Mountain. I would carry it under my arm, and, um, I also started writing in a diary, thinking that maybe I would be sort of a member of like the Bloomsbury group, like the Long Island version someday. <laughs> and I started writing very faithfully in my diary every day, like today I watched Bewitched. And then, <laughs> and then I stopped, I forgot. And I got, oh no, months later I found the diary. It's like, oh no, I better write in it. And I went back and I wrote on every page, nothing happened today. <laughs> <laughs> That's the long answer to your question about yeah. this completely unrelated children's <laughs> book. <laughs> so sorry. Did you construct the novel as email back and forth? Yes. Well, here's the I funny mean, thing. I mean, she wrote half and you wrote half? Well, what happened was Holly's <laughs> husband, when Holly and I met at a, at a kids' book conference, actually, and because I had written a book for a young adult book and a book for kids as well, and she had these wonderful books. And we talked about writing a book together. And her husband said, why don't you and Meg send emails to each other? And we thought he meant do it as a novel in emails. He, he said, oh, I never meant that. I meant just kick around ideas. <laughs> but it turned out to be right away, I started writing in this sort of highly neurotic voice. I don't know where I got my ideas. <laughs> and 
But then we went back and we aren't either character. They're two very different girls, but we, we went and sort of overwrote wrote each other's parts. And both of the girls, both of the characters are very much in us. So we wrote the whole thing separately and together. How fun. What age is that for? Uh, like uh, 10 and up. Yeah. How fun that'll yeah. be. Now, it's so weird with like, what age is this, what age is this for? Oh, um, you know, it's like yeah, 22, 22 to 65. Through the AARP years, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now last year you edited a volume of uh, Great American Short Stories. Best American Short Stories, yes. So that meant you read a lot of short stories. You may be the current expert on what's being written in short stories in yes, America. Yes, I am. Do, I, you have, I, do you have any wisdom? Well, I think that short story, the short story is alive and well in this country. There, there's not any one kind of thing. You must there's have seen just, just tremendous variety to choose I, from. I did. It's really hard to do, to put it together, but um, I laid them out all, uh, you know, on, my, on the floor in my apartment and walked around them and picked them up, and uh, it was great. It was really exciting to put something like that together. How bad, how bad. Uh, would you take some questions? Yeah, I will, Okay, sure. uh, about any of the books? Uh, we've got a microphone here. And here, uh, just come up and Meg will point to you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I was introduced to you by my daughter who gave me female persuasion for Mother's Day. Oh. Okay. And I'm now learning about your work backwards on a timeline. I've just finished the everythings. And it seems to me, particularly listening to you today, that there is a, a similarity between Greer and Jules in terms of their, at least in the beginning, of uh, the development of the characters. They're insecure, they're not very self-aware, and we see them really grow and become more powerful as they get older. And of course, I've only read these two books, but I just wonder if you do make connections to characters, either willingly or not. I think that I don't do it consciously, but I think it's definitely there. I mean. I don't like to write autobiographically. I don't think either of those characters is me, but but it doesn't come from outer space. It comes from something, like you're marinating in these ideas. I gave a reading, uh, an event at, at um, Ann Patchett's bookstore, wonderful bookstore Parnassus, and she was asking me questions from uh, the stage about, and I said something like, I think every writer maybe has like, three or four arias to sing, and Anne said one. And that may be true, that we are a person living in the world, so there's going to be a kind of Venn diagram overlap, I think, among characters. Sure. Thank you. I love your work. Thank you. Hi. My friend wanted me to ask about the end of The Wife, and I did not read your book, so I apologize right now. But now I'm going to read it now that I've seen the movie, and it's out there. But is she writing? her story at the end when she turns the page and she's on the airplane. Does that coincide with your book or like you said, you didn't have a take in the writing um, of the movie? The movie is a little different from the book. You're talking about the movie, right? right. Yeah, the movie's right. a little different from the how book. How are we supposed to interpret the ending of the movie? Oh, did you? I would never tell it? anyone how to interpret an ending. <laughs> I also kind of feel with when you leave your characters behind, I, I leave, do you remember uh, in the Truman Show when he discovers that the world is sort of enclosed? I kind of feel like my characters are in a snow globe and I'm sort of leaving them there. But without a doubt, at the end of The Wife, certainly at the end of the novel of The Wife, and, and in, in the film, there is a new moment for this character, Joan Castleman, who is the wife of the famous bloated novelist. Uh, I, I think that I would hesitate to be more specific than that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> Have you ever gone back, written a sequel of any kind? No, uh, no. I mean, I guess I love leaving, it's not exactly leaving things up to interpretation, but I would say that she's, the difference between the book and the film is one of the, one of the differences. Well, one thing is they made the, the I made up a prize that the, that the husband wins called the Helsinki Prize. It's like two or three steps down from the Nobel. They made it the Nobel Prize in the movie that the novelist's husband wins. Um, but I sort of love the idea of her. She's in first person. The novel is in first person and it's funny and angry. And the film, it's all in Glenn Close's face mm. in so much, close-ups of her, and so much of what she finally gets to say as it starts to unfold. Um, we definitely know that she's moving into something new in both cases. Right. 
Thank you. Sure, thanks. Hi, Meg. It's good to see you again. Hello. Hi. Um, we grew up together, Meg and I, on the same street in Syosset. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Um, I have a comment. I don't read a lot of fiction, but when your book came out, I went to our local library and I said, please order this book. So I filled out the form and I got the book and I read it and I thought, I'm so glad you wrote a book about feminist, feminist history and feminism because I thought, man, it's about time. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your novel, Belshar, partially because it incorporates talking about writing as therapy while not making that overshadow the other elements of the novel. So how did you make that balance of talking about the need for writing and the need for expression, but also incorporating other elements of storytelling? Thank you. So I wrote this young adult novel that she's referring to called Bell Jar, which is kind of a play on the Bell Jar, which is a book that was really important to me. Um, it takes place at a school for um, highly intelligent, troubled teenagers. I would have killed to go to that school, I have to say. You weren't um, troubled enough? I wasn't troubled enough. And as you know, I had to stay in Syosset. Um, but the characters in in the novel are put into a class where they write in a journal and when they write, there's a kind of uh, uh, sort of fantasy element. They write in a journal and they are sort of brought to a moment of where a crisis happened in their lives. I feel expression is everything. Uh, being able to say what you feel. We see it politically with the Me Too movement. We see it with writers. Uh, the need to hear how, what someone's experience was. It's, it's terribly important, so yeah. That was, that was important to them, especially at a moment of adolescence. I mean, one of the reasons I like writing about teenagers is because it's a time of firsts, and, and that definitely comes across in the book, I hope. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you a very boring and cliche author question. It's about characterization, specifically Greer and Faith Frank. Um, I just want, I'm just curious about the lens in which you wrote these uh, lo very lovable, flawed characters, um, sort of your process. And I know they're meticulously detailed down to the blue streaked hair, the boots, um, but I just wanted to know, I guess, like what inspired you for, for their traits? Did it come naturally? Or was it something that was more prescribed? Thank you. Um, coming up with character to me is, it's sort of, you can't force it. You, you know a little bit and then you know a little bit more, kind of like a rip gets worse and worse. And hopefully this is the opposite of a rip. It gets better and better. Um, but I think of character this way. You know how you're at home and you suddenly want to talk to a particular friend? It, and there may be nothing you need to tell that friend. And there may be nothing you need to hear news-wise from that friend. But you feel the desire to speak to them. I feel that that thing that you can't quite name, the way the room temperature changes when you talk to that friend, character ought to be that way. So that when a character comes into being on the page, there's a certain feeling. And then when she returns later, that feeling might return too. It's almost like a theme in like Peter and the Wolf. Like there's a sense of that. And the more you get to know her, the more, or him, the more that comes about, through being aware of how, is, how are things shifting when that character's there, I just try to explore that a little bit. And then the details kind of come, and that's the pleasurable stuff. It's like a waterfall of details. Faith wearing boots. I knew she was a charismatic figure, but then I wanted to make it specific. She's so charismatic. She's so exciting to people. There's the, the female persuasion is kind of a dual love story. It's a love story between Greer and her boyfriend and also between Greer and Faith, this feminist who inspires her. And the idea of someone who you really look up to, let's give her hair, let's give her boots and Faith, and then we know her in a way. So it comes about that way, I think. Thank you. Um, well, I, I um, read The Female Persuasion and I loved it and uh, I've been looking at articles and seeing people talk about it and people talk so much about the relationship between Faith and Greer and also about Corey's development, but uh, 
I don't see a lot of people talking so much about uh, the character of Z, and uh, I don't want to be too spoilery about anything, but I just thought her journey was so interesting. I mean, beyond uh, what happened with Greer, I, I thought that her personal journey about uh, her inner city school teaching and what she learned about herself and about the world was so interesting, and I wondered if you could comment on, on, her, on her character. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess the problem when you write a, a novel that has multiple characters and different, multiple perspectives, it's hard to, you know, for reviews to get everyone in. It could feel a little bit like a, a big, a lot of people at the table. Uh, this is, I, I love writing about female friendship, or about friendship, really, which it happens to often be female friendship, but not always, and the interesting uh, the friendship between Jules and Ethan was a big thing for me. I think friendship is enormously powerful and shifting. And it, when I was a kid, I thought that you and your friends would be together forever. Like that it would be like an episode of Sex and the City where you're always at the same table. It isn't like that. I mean, I have friends you don't see for decades, but the, the minute you see them, you, you continue that thing. That's what life is more like. Um, so Greer and her best friend Z, Z is uh, sort of a young activist, she's queer, she's full of heart in some way, but I think their friendship reaches a point where Greer does something that's not great, and again, here's that moment of threading the needle, not wanting to give things away. People go, oh, I would have read The Female Persuasion, but she told me what happened, so <laughs> I don't need to read it now. Uh, I like writing about the tensions between them, but the love that you have for friends over a long period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, on page 45 of your book, which I Oh, yes. Measure, oh, yes, I know. Yes, I know uh, what you're going to bring yes. up. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you wrote that you believe, a paraphrase, by the way, that the most effective people on the earth are people who are introverts, who taught themselves to be extroverts. And that really resonated with me in many, many ways. And I'm wondering to what extent did you see yourself as the introvert who became the extrovert? Oh, completely, completely. I remember, like last week, my face going so hot and feeling like you, you can't speak. But, force, but really, but forcing yourself to do it and seeing what the, the bounty you reap doing it. No, I mean, it's very, very hard to speak up. And you have this one moment to get anyone's attention, right? And if you miss it, I remember like being a kid and being at one of those horrible parties in someone's basement with the hang in there baby poster, right? You remember that? The cat hanging onto a bar. <laughs> it's very inspiring. Yeah, it's right. It, it's right. It really inspires. We're still here. That's right. It's hanging in there. Um, and the one that said, keep on trucking, and just being at a party and working myself up to say a joke. And as I went to go for the joke, someone else said something funny, and that was it. I missed it. It was like jump rope. And the idea that if you can be more comfortable, because no one, no one is thinking about you as much as you're thinking about yourself. Once I realized that, I think it was easier to talk a little more freely. But yeah, I absolutely think that's me. Thank you. I loved, truly. Loved your book. Thank you. And I want everybody in the room to, re to read it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just, can I, I just saw The Wife yesterday, and I, I, I just incredibly loved it. And I haven't read the book, but based on the different endings, I'm going to go get the book now. I would really like to know, where did that story come from, or how did you come up with that story, or what, whether, what, did something happen? Did you run into somebody? Did you... Let's start with an idea, I mean. Okay, first of all, I'll say the ending, it's not that different. The, the book is pretty faithful, really. Uh, the movie is, the book is faithful to the movie. God. The movie is, is faithful to the book in, in very important ways. Um, I grew, because I grew up with a mother who was a writer, I was sort of looking around at writers, and my mother, when she, for, I noted this, she, when she first published her first novel, um, the headline of one of the reviews said something like, housewife turns into novelist. She said it was as if she went into a phone booth and came out as Superman. You would think it was such a you know, huge thing that, that to do for a housewife to turn into a novelist. A certain kind of condescension. And I thought, what if I wrote a book from the point of view of 
this woman who was, wives are, the, the idea of the wife, people who would sort of maybe want to get to the big man and go to the wife to sort of as a sneaky way in. What secrets does the wife of this big man from this era have? And I started, and I, I went to Smith College before I transferred to Brown, and I was a big, as I said, a reader of the Bell Jar and Sylvia Plath, and Plath, Plathiana is all over that that place, Northampton, Massachusetts, and, and Smith College. And I wrote about a char my character, Joan, when she's young, has an affair with her professor and uh, falls in love with him. He leaves his wife, and she goes off, and he becomes this big writer. And it's a book full of rage and humor, and I didn't have to keep them separate. And I just thought about I just thought about writers and what it's been like, the mid-century male writers and the notion of male importance and, and how we've looked at that over time. But what if I did that, but it wasn't a polemic, it was funny and angry all at once. So it was, it was a great, great relief and a pleasure to write. One more. Okay. So I wanted to let you know I, I have a male voice and <laughs> that I, um, as a male, uh, really enjoyed your work and I actually wanted to ask a question of Ron if if you don't mind. I, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> um, do you think uh, Meg's work ought to be required reading for modern males? <laughs> <laughs> Particularly in this day and age? Um, Definitely. Yes. yes. Okay. So we agree on that. Uh, yeah. Good answer as they say on Family Feud. <laughs> <laughs> We became friends years ago, so I haven't been able to review her work in the paper, uh, but I certainly read it and enjoy it, definitely, and learn and, a lot from it. And I know I had a conversation with you earlier, Meg, uh, about how um, you've helped uh, start many conversations in my family with my daughter and my wife, so thank you very much for that. And my I, pleasure. I wish to, uh, well, you, you you should start a conversation uh, in our society as a whole about some of these issues. So, thank, you. thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, wait. Is she, we can she take, take one yeah, more. Yeah. Meg, I want to ask you something very self absorbed. Is it possible I could speak to you after the presentation? <laughs> sure. sure. Thanks. <laughs> Everyone, come speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> one at a time, I will give you each a real moment of bonding. <laughs> But well, yes. thank you for this moment of bonding. Thank you very it's much. It's been for a coming. real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.